In this video, we're going to talk about using atomic spectra and something called the Bohr model. It's B-O-H-R. It's named after a scientist. So hopefully at this point, uh, we're going to look at these emission spectrum. That is a spectrum of light when energy is added to a substance, many substances will emit light. And so sometimes we can see that in the visible spectrum, other times we can't. So we're going to take a look at a few specific cases of that. And hopefully we're looking at flame tests, that's something we'll do in class, and discharge tubes. So those are two kind of cool activities that you have either done or will do in class around the time of this video. So let's talk about what a spectrum looks like. You may have seen a prism before, and it takes sunlight or electric light, like a, a light bulb, and it splits it into the colors of the spectrum. And you may remember Roy G. Biv, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and the colors that come from the sunlight. Uh, it's the same thing if we use a uh, a little slit with a prism with a particular substance in the bulb. Uh, in this case, this is showing a hydrogen gas discharge tube, so we're putting electricity through it. You can see on the left side the little positive and negative. And it doesn't give this wide spectrum of all the different colors, it just gives certain lines. And there's a reason for that. There are different atomic emission spectra for every different element. And you can see the top one is barium. It has a number of lines. Calcium uh, has different lines than barium. It's a way that you can identify things. Lithium has four very specific lines. Sodium has two lines that are very close together that give sodium, the, in a flame, its very characteristic orange color. And then these are just a couple of more examples. And as you do these activities, you'll get to see some of these spectra yourselves. All right, so let's talk about a, a, just a really simple model. When you think about hydrogen, the, the thing that's really unique about hydrogen is that it has only one electron. And that it makes really simple to do these calculations because you're not dealing with multiple different electrons in multiple different subshells and energy levels. We've just got that one electron in the 1s subshell. So we don't have to worry about any other interactions between other electrons and other energy levels. So what we know about the hydrogen atom is that all of the subshells are degenerate. Degenerate means they're at the same energy level with each other in the same shell. You've seen this little model before when we talked about the uh, electron configurations, but you can see that they are at, they're all on the same level instead of 2s being below 2p, 3s being below 3p, they're all on the exact same level because there are no electrons in there. And so we don't have to worry about transitions, uh, we can just worry about transitions from one shell to another, we don't have to worry about which subshell it ends up in, whether it's 2s or 2p, it just makes it a lot less complicated. Alright, so I want to show you this. So this shows you a model of the hydrogen atom, and this is what we call the Bohr model. Remember uh, that when we talk about the electrons in an atom, we talk about that electron cloud. Niels Bohr was a scientist who proposed the little orbits that electrons orbited around the, elect the nucleus in fixed paths. So that's, how it, that's just a visual way for us to look at this. So if we have a hydrogen atom, in the nucleus there's one proton, that's it. And then there's one electron in the lowest energy level, the first energy level. And you can see that these other energy levels are there, but they don't have any electrons in them because it's hydrogen atom, one electron. So let's add energy. That could come from electricity or a flame. And you can see that that energy is absorbed by the electron. The electron becomes excited and moves to a higher energy level. Then it drops back down to a lower energy level and it emits a photon of light. Sometimes that vi is visible, sometimes it's not. You saw that little photon was pink. Let's add some energy to this electron because once that electron is in that second shell, you're continuing to add energy, it can move again. So in this case, here comes the energy. It's again absorbed by the electron. 
it moves up to a different excited state. In this case, it moved up to the fifth energy level. And then it's going to drop back down and emit another photon of light. This time it was blue, so it was just a different thing that you saw. So the color of the light and whether it's visible or not visible comes from the fact that the light is emitted at a certain wavelength. And if it falls in the visible part of the spectrum, we can see it. So here's what's happening just in words. I know I just described it. The energy starts in the ground state. So when you do your electron configurations, those are ground state electron configurations. That's their starting point. We add energy. That can be in the form of electricity or a flame. The electron absorbs energy, moves to an excited state, to a higher energy level. And then it drops back down to a ground state or it can drop back down to a lower excited state. And when that happens, it emits light and that may be visible or not. So if you look in your reference table, you can see that you have this Bohr model for the hydrogen atom. And so what it, it looks kind of funky, but let's look at what all the parts are. You've got these specific energy levels. Remember those energy levels correspond to the periods and you can see that the one for the hydrogen atom has six showing on the page. And then you, the little arrows show the transition from the excited state to the ground state, and then the light that is produced by that transition. So if you wanted to look at a particular transition, we can take our pencil and we can go around. We find n equals 4. We're going from n equals 4 to n equals 2 and follow that circle around. And we want to find the, the arrow that starts with the dot on n equals 4 and then the arrow ends on n equals 2. So start on n equals 4, that one ends on n equals 3. So we've got to go around a little bit more. And then here is one that starts on n equals 4 and it ends on n equals 2. So now that we have found that particular one, we want to, we found the right transition, n equals 4 to n equals 2, and then we want to follow that down. And this tells us the wavelength of light that is emitted. And it gives us 486, and if you look at the chart it says it's in nanometers, so that's 486 nanometers. And that's the wavelength of light produced by electrons that make that particular transition. When you have electrons, more than one electron in an atom, what happens is the subshells are more spaced out. They're not all on the same energy level because some of them have electrons in them. And so it just becomes a lot more complicated to determine the transitions, and that's why we use the hydrogen atom. It's nice and straightforward. Like in this example, here's lithium. Lithium only has three electrons. And so we know that it's electron configuration is 1s2, 2p1. You can see that there's a line at 670 nanometers. Actually, it looks like 6700 on this scale, but it's a red line, and it's because the uh, electron has gone from 1s2, 2p1. It's actually dropped down. The electron that was in 2p1 has dropped to 2s1. So it goes from the excited state to the ground state, and then it's, that's the one that gives us the lithium flame test its color. So when you did your lithium flame test, it had a very characteristic red color. But you can see each one of those other lines, there are four lines there, has its own transition. I don't expect you to know this. I just want you to understand how it works. So the one at 610 or 6100 on that scale, kind of the orangey color, that one, it it jumped up to 3d1 and the electron dropped back to 2p1 so that was it went to an excited state dropped back down to a lower excited state and then the at 497 that greenish line that one is a different transition so you can see that there are all these different transitions happening and that's just in an atom that has three electrons so you can imagine as you get more electrons you get more and more of these little transitions and lines. It gets a lot more complicated, but each one is very unique to the element. So let's look at how to do another practice problem. In this case, it's asking what is the wavelength of a photon emitted from a hydrogen atom when an electron jumps from n equals 3 to n equals 1. So remember that what we want to do 
is find a circle that says n equals 3 and we want to follow it around and find the dot that starts there. Now those none of those start on n equals 3 so we're going to follow it around. This one starts on n equals 3 but it ends on n equals 2 so we're going to keep going around. There's one that starts on n equals 3 and it ends on n equals 1 so we're going to follow that backwards down the, to the table. And you can see it's the center line here and so you can see that that's 103 and remember that the unit on this is nanometers. So let me just write that in. 103 nanometers. And that's all it's asking you. I could ask you the type of light and you can look back down at that scale and see that it is UV. We'll do some more practice problems in class. If you have questions, I'll see you then.